Okay. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the North County Estate Planning Council of San Diego's uh, virtual breakfast gathering. Um, I'm Oli Ben from the Jewish Community Foundation. We're happy to host today. Um, if you have any questions or technical problems, feel free to contact uh, me by email, um, Oli at jcfsandiego.org, and we'll try and help you. Um, but I'm going to turn it over to Phil now to do the introduction. So, Phil, over to you. Thanks, Ollie. It's uh, Phil Sullivan in San Diego. Welcome everyone to the May meeting of the North County State Planning Council. Uh, I'm stepping in for Bill Super today. Bill's actually on the, on the webinar, but he, uh, I asked him and he gave me the permission to uh, give you an update on his uh, health. Bill had what he called some health excitement. He had a pacemaker put in and long story short, he had some surgery. He's doing well, it's non-COVID related and he, um, uh, basically has a scratchy throat and asked me to step in, although I think <clears throat> my throat's a little scratchy too. So anyway, Bill uh, is doing well and uh, everybody was sending him well wishes. I too sent him well wishes. I'm stepping into his shoes, which are big shoes to fill. And we um, hope, Bill, you uh, recover and we hope to get back on track with uh, normal meetings. So uh, today, uh, let me see, we appreciate um, all of you tuning in to today's webinar. I think it's the first time we've had the webinar. And I'll be honest, it's my first time announcing a webinar, that's for sure. And, um, but I've, I have attended webinars such as this. So as Ollie said, if you have questions about linking in, please just send him an email and he'll try to assist you via the email. Okay, this one is on the second Tuesday of the month, but going forward, we're still doing our regular Tuesday meetings. Um, and because of the COVID issue, we're not able to meet in person for this short term. And we'll see how that goes. The next webinar, which I'll announce at the end of uh, Paul's presentation, uh, will be um, uh, on uh, June 2nd, I think, and I'll, I'll uh, state that again. Okay, and a uh, couple of things, a couple of bookkeeping things. We are providing MCLE and uh, state specialist credits along with CPAs, uh, CPEs, trust professionals, and lawyers. You can log in tomorrow and there'll be a place you can sign. Bill wanted me to especially thank Dan Wilson and Roberta Robinson for their assistance in getting this uh, format set up for us, which is wonderful. And I thank you because I'm back to zero on my MCLE credits, so I'm climbing up the ladder again in the next three years. Uh, Bill said, if there are topics you're interested in, please email anyone on the board, him or me, and then we'll uh, take it under consideration. So today's program is called um, Best Planning Ideas Today in the Face of COVID-19. Covfefe, or Covfefe, and chaos. And, and um, Paul Lee of Northern Trust is going to present it. I'm going to uh, provide a proper introduction to Paul in a second. But what I need to say, and Ollie's already spoken, is to say thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone at the Jewish Community Foundation for making this Zoom uh, presentation possible. And Ollie, uh, if you could take a couple minutes just to uh, introduce people more to the JCF and uh, tell them what you do. And again, thank you. And uh, after you're done, then I'll introduce Paul formally. Thanks. So I'm actually going to turn it over to Jeremy Pohl, who's our CFO, who's going to um, share a few words. Well, thanks so much, Jolly, and thank you, Phil. Uh, this is Jeremy Pearl. I'm Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer of the Jewish Community Foundation. Suddenly had the pleasure of meeting uh, many of you under happiest circumstances in person from all of us. Hope you're staying um, safe and well. So uh, some of you know the Jewish Community Foundation, but a quick refresher. We're very uh, honored to be the oldest community foundation here in San Diego. We were established in 1967. We oversee around $500 million in funds. And our business is essentially uh, composed of three core components. Uh, like many community foundations, we uh, manage endowments in perpetuity for the benefit of local and national nonprofits. We serve around 800 families and their philanthropy, supporting them to uh, leverage their grant, maker, grant making. And one of our increasingly important businesses is we also support nonprofits and we provide the infrastructure and investment management. Uh, very honored to hold the uh, endowment and other funds for around 80 nonprofits here in San Diego. Um, obviously, uh, a number of those are, are Jewish and many of those are not. Um, in terms of grant making and um, impact, uh, very important, more important than ever um, during these times of needs. 
of the last five years, we have averaged around uh, $100 million a year out in grant making to the local and national community. Uh, in any one year, that's typically somewhere around 70 to 75% general secular grant making um, and the balance of that uh, specifically to the Jewish community. So we're a very diverse um, uh, community foundation uh, and that's certainly one of the things that um, uh, you may not uh, fully uh, fully appreciate about um, our business. A couple of uh, local notes here during this time of crisis. We, of course, along with the other local community foundations, are very focused on um, the exigent needs in our community. We've formed three emergency funds, um, two of them specifically um, focused on the uh, local community, one serving vulnerable local uh, populations and the other a public health response COVID-19 fund. Um, and our donors, um, and, and indeed uh, many donors across the region who don't have to have a fun with us have, have stepped up, um, as I'm sure you've been reading in the press, we've got a tremendously um, generous community here in San Diego. Uh, a couple of programs I just want to bring your attention to, actually one specifically, is the Trusted Charitable Advisor Program. And that is a program we uh, started about three, four years ago. It's a network of um, professional advisors uh, dedicated to building relationships and integrating charitable planning as a strategy for achieving uh, the client's overall goals. And it's been a wonderful partnership. We've been very honored to work. I know I've worked personally with several of you um, on cases uh, involving uh, uh, clients' um, uh, current and uh, legacy testamentary charitable giving. We're um, very proud to partner with you and support you and your clients um, whenever um, we can. The uh, Trusted Charitable Advisor Program is a uh, cohort that meets um, annually. It's a, a less than one year, sort of an academic year program. Uh, just a few meetings uh, for us all to share experiences around the discipline of charitable planning. And uh, we do have uh, an upcoming uh, class coming, uh, starting I think next month. And any of you who are interested, please, Thank you, Ollie. On the screen there, please uh, contact uh, my colleague Charlene Wallop, Charlene at jcfsandiego.org. We'd be honored to um, uh, learn with you um, over the next uh, next uh, year. So that's it from us. And again, thank you for um, thank you for allowing us a moment to uh, talk about uh, what's going on in uh, philanthropy from our lens here in San Diego. And uh, back to you, Ollie. Ollie, did you want to say anything else? No, no, no. Back over to you. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, uh, Jeremy, and thank you, Ollie, first of all, for setting this up, because seriously, I could not do it. And so um, I, we truly appreciate it. That's number one. Number two, personally, I've worked with JCF with many of my clients and uh, had uh, incredible success. So I uh, echo what Jeremy said. It's, it's been a wonderful relationship for attorneys as well as San Diego. Okay, so without further ado, here's the uh, kind of agenda. We're gonna get Paul going right now after I introduce him. He's gonna speak till, for about, um, about 60, 70 minutes, till about 10 after nine. And then we're gonna leave a, about 10, 15 minutes at the end if anybody has questions that they wanna ask Paul. I'll attempt to monitor that. I'm not exactly sure how that works, but I'll be here and I'll um, be able to announce the, the question and people can send in the questions and such. Uh, and we can get that to Paul. So the uh, presentation today. Um, if you, um, I'm happy to take questions as we go along. So if, if you monitor the Q&A in the chat and if something comes up, I'm, I'm happy to answer as we go along. So, oh, so just, yeah, and just for everyone's benefit, the, um, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom. You can submit questions there and Phil can keep track of them as they come in and you know either interrupt or um, we'll just wait till the end. So that's how you do it. Ah, terrific. Wow, I'm learning. Okay, uh, so again, the presentation today is the best planning ideas today in the face of COVID-19, COVID, Fifi, and chaos. So I've heard Paul speak, wow, at ACTEC, at the uh, Southern California, at um, uh, Heckerling many times. He is the global fiduciary strategist of Northern Trust Company working in the global family <clears throat> and private investment offices. Uh, he's also a senior vice president and managing director of the company. And he worked at Bernstein prior to Northern, and he was a partner in the Atlanta firm of Smith, Grambell, and Russell. He's a fellow of the American College of Trust and States Council. Paul graduated uh, from Cornell 
uh, and then he got his JD at Emory. Uh, he's got just numerous, numerous. I could spend probably 10 minutes, Paul, given all your your um, presentations, but I'll, I'll cut to the chase. He, he's, he's a great guy to listen to. He's funny, and he kind of makes tax fun. Is that possible? So anyway, Paul, uh, <laughs> thank you for presenting today. And I'll, I'll let you take over from here. And uh, you got about uh, 70 minutes, so keep us entertained. Okay, let's see if I can get this uh, going. Um, I don't know what you see here, hold on. We see your screen, we just need you to go back to the beginning. Yeah, share screen, this is it. And I think I have to do that. Are you, um, are you seeing the title slide or the? No, you're gonna have to just left it back. Let's scroll back to the beginning of the, of the deck. There it is. Uh, so why, why don't we uh, jump into this? The best planning ideas today in the face of COVID-19. Uh, I have no idea how to um, pronounce, but I think it's Kofethi, but who knows, uh, and chaos. Um, so um, I think everybody knows what's going on to the left. Um, and I think everybody knows we all are feeling and our clients are feeling um, an enormous amount of anxiety, um, maybe even fear, uh, frustration and anger. And, you know, one of the reasons why I put together this presentation is to really underscore how important it is for us as advisors um, to, I mean, I, I don't want to be um, too highfalutin about it, but to be a beacon of light when things seem uh, so dark and when there's so much uncertainty. Um, we all know that, um, that we have a global recession going on. Uh, one of my clients actually nicknamed it recession by proclamation. We all know that there's an enormous amount of volatility in the market. We all know that interest rates uh, have plummeted and are at historical lows. And we also know that the CARES Act and other relief measures just in the United States are costing trillions and trillions of dollars. And all of these things that are happening on the left will cause us to have to provide advice on how to navigate the way forward. Now, from an estate planning standpoint, and, and Bill has asked me to, to concentrate on some of the more um, uh, technical um, planning ideas, um, we all know that transferring value, transferring assets at a depressed value um, is the name of the game when it comes to transfer tax planning. Um, you know, with the historically low interest rates, obviously many of the techniques that we can rely on, whether they're installment sales or intrafamily loans or GRATs are interest rate sensitive. And so this turns out to be a very good time. Um, one of the things that I really want to hit home in terms of many of the ideas that we'll be talking about today is that given what our clients are feeling and given the amount of uncertainty in terms of um, what the economic and even the medical um, path forward is going to be, I've really concentrated many of the techniques that I'm talking about um, to concentrate on those things that provide cash flows or the option to get cash flows, but still allow you to transfer those assets out. And so um, uh, I'm not gonna talk a lot about just simply giving assets away. I, I, you know, anybody can obviously do if they wanna take advantage of the applicable exclusion amounts that we have uh, in place. Um, you know, one thing I'll point out with a $2.7 trillion relief package with much more likely to go, it's already anticipated that the, um, the federal budget deficit next year is going to be $3.7 trillion. I've got a chart to sort of show what that looks like on a chart. All that portends is it is very, very highly likely that we are going to have higher income tax rates in the future. And so taking that into account in terms of what we'll be talking about, I think is gonna be very important. And uh, finally, and sadly, we need to be prepared for unexpected and premature deaths from a planning standpoint. And so really concentrating on those things that um, while we have a very volatile time in the market or um, just for, from an economy standpoint, 
how do we put together um, techniques that one, give our clients options to get back the assets or get access to the assets or cash flow for the rest of their lifetime, but maybe defer payments so that while the market is very volatile, uh, we don't devastate uh, whatever the underlying asset happens to be. And so with that, maybe just a couple of charts that I don't want to go into too much detail. Um, this is really something that I think maybe if you want to share with your clients, um, just to get some perspective on this, this just shows you historically, um, you know, the major crises, the market crises um, in the United States. And you can see that the event length um, from um, peak to get back to where you started from is anywhere from a year and nine months to maybe even 17 years. Now, nobody knows where uh, the COVID-19 recession is going to take us. But one of the things that sort of jumps out at me is here is at this point in the market, um, and I think it's still very early on, we've had a drawdown of 34%, which is uh, uh, about what we had in the 87 crash. But look how quickly it came. It came in 23 days. And, uh, you know, we, we anticipate an enormous amount of volatility in the market over the next few years as we climb out of this recession. Um, just a reminder that uh, at least historically, the US market has had very, very strong returns from the bottom, whether it's over one, five or 10 years. And so if we have depressed values and if we, it's all about pushing those, uh, the appreciation out of the estate, which is what all of these uh, estates techniques are all about, this is an absolutely great time to be doing that. So, we have a $2.7 trillion relief and stimulus package already in place. That, um, as I said, is going to take the estimated uh, federal deficit to $3.9 trillion the last time we looked. Um, there's a report that says in the next quarter, the, um, the U.S. government is going to be issuing treasuries uh, to the tune of $2.99 trillion just in the quarter. Uh, I, I think this just pretends, obviously, for much higher income tax rates in the future at some point. Um, and I think that has to happen regardless of um, what party ends up running the government uh, from this point forward. Um, I'd also uh, mention to you, um, you know, if there is a change in Congress where um, maybe a Democratic president, by way of example, I think there's a very high probability that um, today's transfer tax rates are going to go up. Um, it is much easier to go from 40 to 55% on the estate tax um, uh, than trying to push through a wealth tax, which I, you know, was an idea, uh, at least from the Warren camp uh, earlier this year, which uh, everybody thought was unconstitutional in the first place. And so I think we should anticipate higher income tax rates and higher transfer tax rates and I think we might have to anticipate that our applicable exclusion amount, which lots of people have lots of, is going to go down to or um, no longer go up. So to that end, let's uh, a really quick one. Roth conversions. Um, if your clients can afford to do a Roth conversion, now is the time to do it. Um, one, asset values are down. Um, and if we had been smart, uh, when they were down 34%, we would have taken our traditional IRA and converted it. Um, to sort of uh, round this out, um, what this means is lower income tax rates today. And so the resulting income tax liability is likely to be lower than it otherwise would be in the future. And then, uh, you know, an idea here that sort of dovetails with the CARES, uh, some of the stimulus that's in the CARES Act is taking the income tax liability that otherwise would have been um, gone to the government and give it to the Jewish Community Foundation by way of example. Um, so what's the benefit here? Obviously, one, you're helping charity, you're helping people in need. Two, the income tax liability that otherwise would have gone to the government um, is out of your state for estates tax purposes. Um, uh, Three, the income tax, uh, the charitable deduction that you get is actually going to reduce your income tax liability. And because the CARES Act provides for 100% AGI limitation for cash gifts in 2020, 
And because it is for public charities like the Jewish Community Foundation, it's a, it's a perfect dovetailing of this idea. And then having it in the Roth IRA to grow income tax free and not subject to the Medicare surcharge in the future at a time when income tax rates are likely to be significantly higher. Uh, it, it seems to me this is one of the easiest things to be talking to our clients about. So we know we have a new tax act. Uh, some people call it the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. I call it the Tax Cafeti and Gibberish Act. And this is not a political statement. It is just an acknowledgement that this particular tax act was really thrown together like a Frankenstein's monster behind closed doors. It was everybody's pet project thrown together without any input from the legal or tax community as to how all of it works together. And this is one of the reasons why the regulatory process uh, in terms of pushing out guidance has been so prolific. It's, uh, it, 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 it takes an enormous amount of effort to make all of, these, all of the different code sections um, jive together. From an estate planning standpoint, uh, what it did is it, it took the ATRA tax landscape and um, I, you know, this slide I presented at the North County Estate Planning Council at least three or four times. Uh, as you may recall, this is the, my graphic representation of what happened after ATRA, which was that transfer tax planning was going to be changed dramatically, where the center point of everything is the step up in basis. And the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act did nothing more than push these two things together, at least temporarily. The reason and, and uh, what that means is, or the reason for that is, is the applicable exclusion amount has temporarily been um, doubled. Now, uh, who knows whether or not the doubling of the applicable exclusion is going to make it to 2026, especially with deficits as high as we anticipate them to be. But I will point out to you what the anti-clawback regulations made clear are two things. You can make a gift of the bonus exclusion and pass away when you no longer have the bonus exclusion in the code uh, after 2026 or earlier than that, and you will not be penalized um, with a phantom estate tax liability because that bonus exclusion is not in existence. That's the first thing that it taught us. The second thing that it taught us is that this bonus exclusion, which all of us supposedly got and all of us supposedly benefit from, actually the vast majority of our clients will never benefit from the bonus exclusion. And the reason for it is, is what the anti-clawback regulations made clear is that you cannot use any portion of the bonus exclusion unless you burn up and use up first your original base exclusion. Now, the reason why that is particularly um, difficult from a, from a planning standpoint is that it really changes the way we have we thought about it. Before we had this temporary um, doubling of the exclusion, remember what I used to say about the exclusion. If you have these very big exclusions and they're going to grow over time and you can still do zeroed out transfers like grants and installment sales, what that means is from a planning standpoint is that the advice to our client should be you should not use up any of your applicable exclusion amounts during lifetime. You should not make any large taxable gifts. You should preserve it, keep it, so that when you pass away with it, not only does it represent a large dollar amount of $5.79 million that you can die or pass away with um, and not have to pay any transfer tax, but it also represents a free step up in basis. And so the the rule used to be all clients should not use large taxable gifts. And if they have an estate tax problem, they should just do a lot of zeroed out transfers, which will get the appreciation out of the estate, which is exactly what you would have gotten if you had used a gift. But by preserving it, you have this sort of a double superpower with this exclusion. Unfortunately, what this means is is that in order to get the benefit of the bonus exclusion, we have to go to our clients and say, in order to get this bonus exclusion, you have to use up your base exclusion and rob them of this free step up in basis. And so with that as a background, here's what I've been telling clients and advisors. I think you need to think about 
the, your clients in three different pockets. There is the up to wealthy people, and by the way, that's me, anywhere between zero net worth up to, I say here, $11.58 million, could be less, could be a little more. I don't know if it's single people or if it's um, two spouses that together, but basically in this cohort, which by the way, is the vast majority of the people in the United States, um, don't make any large taxable gifts. Preserve your applicable exclusion. You're not gonna get the benefit of the bonus exclusion, but you will get, you won't have a transfer tax problem and you will get a free step up in basis. Then on the far right, here are the ultra wealthy people. And probably this $40 million number is probably low, but if we are lucky enough to have uh, clients in the ultra wealthy realm, these are the people where they can truly afford to give away both the bonus and the base exclusion and probably affords to give it away in a very simple way where they, do no, they no longer have to retain any economic interests or options to get at it anymore. They won't get the free step up in basis to the extent of the base exclusion, but that saving is likely to be small in the grand scheme of things when you think about transfer tax and income tax planning in the broad sort of set of it. And then we have the middle cohort, which I have uh, nicknamed the middle class wealthy here. And I suspect, and you know, based on my conversations with professional advisors, this is the plurality of the clients that they have. These are the middle class wealthy that have a little bit of an estate tax problem or a significant estate tax problem, but they're not so wealthy that they can just simply give it away. And so you have to think about strategies that allow our clients to either use their uh, bonus and base and retain some of the base of another spouse or in ways where they can get the option to get the assets or the economic benefit from those assets. And so obviously spousal lifetime access trust um, uh, will be talked about again, like they were in 2012, 2011 and 2012. And I, I'll mention something about spousal lifetime access trust. Um, this is not, um, uh, this is a relatively straightforward idea. I just want to do a practice point um, for everyone. Um, we all know the game here, and um, just so you know, I call it a splat, uh, and I call it a splat only because when I used to call it a slat, uh, about 35% of the times, there was always some joker, and it was always a guy who said, well, what about a spousal, spousal lifetime uni trust? And so to avoid any conversation like that, we're going to do, we're going to call it a splat. We know what a splat is. You have a grant or spouse who, who uses up their bonus and their base exclusion, or if they've already used their bonus, they use their, ba their base exclusion, they use their bonus exclusion in order to get the assets out of the estate for the benefit of the uh, beneficiary spouse. And the thought here is, as long as the grantor spouse and the beneficiary spouse remain alive and married together, the grantor spouse will always have indirect access from the beneficiary spouse because there's no penalty here because 1041 says any transfers or any transactions between spouses is ignored for income tax purposes. And the, um, the gift tax uh, marital deduction says any transfers is not subject to gift tax. And so relatively straightforward. Where the, the planning really gets comp somewhat complicated is, do you or can you give the beneficiary spouse a limited testamentary power of appointment? If that spouse passes away, they can then appoint it back to the original grantor spouse. And um, lots of people have talked about the step transaction and all of those other things. I wanna talk about a very subtle point that a lot of, um, a, uh, a lot of uh, estate planning presenters don't talk about, and it is the common law rule that under the, mo the, the, under the vast majority of states, the common law rule is if a grantor creates a trust for the benefit of a beneficiary, and that beneficiary has a power of appointment, whether limited or general, and it gets exercised back to the original grantor spouse, 
the common law rule is those assets are subject to the original grantor's creditors, which means that trust is included in that grantor spouse's estate for estate's tax purposes. Lots of people don't talk about that. What that means from a practice standpoint is the following. If you want to play this game, you have to make sure that you create this trust in a jurisdiction that has changed the common law rule. So what you are looking for is a specific statute that says under certain circumstances and what you're looking for is a gift of the unified credit amount. That's typically what people will see in these statutes. It changes the common law rule and says the original grantors creditors, creditors cannot get at that if it get, gets exercised back to the original grantor spouse. And so look for that. I don't know if California has changed that rule. I don't think so, but I believe um, Texas has, Delaware has, Florida has, and if they've done it, it's likely that Nevada has too, but I don't, I, I don't know that with any real certainty. So with that, let's move on to some of the more exciting things. Um, well, first and foremost, let's leverage this historically low long-term AFR. And you can see here the short, mid, and long-term uh, latest thoughts are that these are actually going to go lower next year, uh, next month. But you can see here right now, we're at the at historically low long-term AFR at 1.15 and also at the midterm rate. Um, lots of people will be refinancing uh, pre-existing loans and installment sales. Um, just sort of a practice note, um, while most people don't think that you require consideration in order to do that if you have a prepayment provision in there, there's still some debate out there. And if you want to avoid the debate, then just prepay the debt and replace the note with a new promissory note. Uh, I think that's probably the easiest way to do it. Um, one other practice note that I'll mention to you is that there has been a truism for a number of years, and I think it's based upon a 1986 GCM, that you have to remember that the term of the note should not be longer than the life expectancy of the holder of the note. The IRS has taken the position um, in that GCM that if that is the case, it is much more like a private annuity and it should be treated like a private annuity. Most importantly, you're subject to um, the exhaustion test and you're not allowed to use the long-term AFR. You have to use the 7520 rate in terms of valuing whatever that transaction happens to be which under these circumstances won't be the worst, except you may not be able to satisfy the exhaustion test issue. So with that, let's move on to um, one note that I'll say here. If you are looking for the easiest way to reduce the value of your client's transfer tax estate, just make a huge loan today. Remember what loans are today. The, the current rule is, a poorly secured um, interest only balloon note at the AFR um, that's not even adequately secured and that is not recourse, it's non-recourse, that's fair market value. What I point out to you is, is that the proposed treasury regulations under 2704, which were withdrawn, makes it clear to me that the IRS has a treasury regulation that they want to drop at some point in the future where they will basically say, you need to have promissory notes or loans that are adequately secured, require periodic payments on a non-deferred basis, issued at market interest rates, and then bootstrap has to have a fair market value equal to the liability. And so I anticipate in the future that these regulations will drop and it will dramatically change the economics of all installment sales and um, intra-family loans. But what it means today is, at today's lowest interest rates today, you can go ahead and do this without any transfer tax consequences. And then tomorrow, down the line, when our clients pass away and this regulation has gone in, you will have an inadequately secured, um, very low interest rate note that is not at fair market value. And so 
you're able to take a discount on a relatively straightforward estate planning technique. And, um, you know, this works, by the way, for the billionaires of the world. So if I were lucky enough to have lots of billionaires as clients, I would tell them they should just simply sell a billions of dollars of their assets to or loan them um, to an intentionally defective grantor trust, take 1.15% uh, interest only balloon note, push out the term for as long as we can push it out, but not beyond um, life expectancy, and just live off of the 1.15 for likely the rest of your lifetime, and then just pass away with the promissory note very high probability that you've saved them hundreds of millions of dollars in estate tax. So let's move on. Since we've talked about long-term AFRs, let's talk about the 75-20 rates. And we know that the, um, we have a historically low section 75-20 rate at 0.8%. The, uh, the latest thoughts and projections are saying that there is a chance that next month it will go to 0.6 which is a long way of saying, thankfully, we may not have to run around and try to do all the things that we're talking about here this month, and it might even get better next month. And so let's talk about long-term grants, and let's talk about uh, something that is controversial, which is, what about a 100-year grant, or since you're sitting next to Nevada, and Nevada has a rule against perpetuities period of 365 years, why not do a 365 year grant today? And so what, what, why would you do this? One, if you have a 100 or 365 year term, your grantor is going to die during the term, which means your grantor for the rest of their lifetime will have locked in what? They will have locked in an annuity that will last them for the rest of their lifetime. Secondly, Locking it in today allows you to lock in the 0.8% 75-20 rate. And so on the left-hand part of this slide, and many of the numbers in this presentation are based on 10 million, but we know it could be a million, it could be 10, it could be 100 million. I just wanted the math to be relatively straightforward. If you do 100-year grants today and you want to zero out that gift, what you need to retain as a grantor is a $145,000, $656 annuity. And so that effectively is what? A 1.45% return on your assets. And so there's your cash flow for the rest of your lifetime that you can guarantee that you're going to get. The reason you do this or even consider it is, is you have to remember that the estate tax inclusion amount when your grantor dies during the term is the lesser of the fair market value of the grad assets or what the treasury regulations say is the amount of principal to pay the annuity $145,000 in perpetuity and the way to figure out what that dollar amount is is you take the annuity payment 145,656 and you divide it by the 75-20 rate at death. So take a look at the 1% rate. If the 75-20 rate is 1% when your client passes away, the amount of inclusion amount is $14.565 million, which you would think is not what you would wanna have happen here. Except remember, if the assets are still at $10 million at that point in time, the amount of inclusion is exactly 10. So in other words, you can't lose on this calculation. It can only be lower than the fair market value if the 75-20 rate happens to go above one. At 3% by way of example, the amount of inclusion is $4.855 million. And so let me give you a provocative thought here. What if you put $10 million of municipal bond securities into this graph? And those bonds yield at exactly $145,000 of tax exempt income. The coupon is $145,000. What this idea allows you to do is keep the coupon for the rest of your lifetime, 
let's assume the fair market value of those assets stay at exactly $10 million. If the 7520 rate goes to three, which is much less than the long term average, the amount of inclusion is $4.8 million, which is nothing more than saying you got a 51% valuation discount on marketable securities that should not be entitled to any discount. So you're effectively allowing yourself to get um, valuation discounts on marketable securities, retain the income for the rest of your lifetime, and God forbid the assets actually grow in value. And so you can actually see if the assets that you put in there grow by 7% over 5, 10, 15, 20, and 25 years, you can see what the value is assuming um, that rate of return. And obviously the numbers get even greater um, uh, from a benefit standpoint on the 365 year graph number. Okay, so many of you will never ever do a 100 or 365 year graph because it's kind of provocative. But take a look at the numbers for 50, 60, and 70 years. This is again, 10 million in, zeroed out. You can see how the numbers work out over this time. The, the point of this is to say, you know, maybe your clients um, want more than $145,000 from this asset. So going 50 years out allows them re to retain a $243,000 annuity for the rest of their lifetime and hope for the benefit of uh, getting the mathematics from an estate planning standpoint uh, over on the right. But all of this has basically been a setup, to be quite honest, because I understand how you all may feel about a 100 or 365 year graph, but we live in a world where we want to use the bonus exclusion. And so why not consider, and I know that the, the vast majority of you do not use up applicable exclusions when you uh, use do a grat, but why not do a bonus exclusion gift and go 50, 60, or 70 years out? What you see here is how the numbers would work out if you put in $10 million into a grat only took back an annuity that was exactly equal to $4.21 million, which means you end up with a $5.79 million taxable gift using up the bonus exclusion, but importantly, allowing you to keep the cash flow from that 10. The 50 year grad allows you to keep $102,491. And you can see how the math works out on the right. And what I, the point of starting at 100 and 365 years is, the numbers on the right, whether it's 50, 60, or 70 years, are as good or better than the 100 or 365 year graph. Now, just one practice note here. Remember, in order to zero this out, this has to be a Walton graph, which on the regulations means that when your client passes away, the ongoing payments that have yet to be un, uh, paid have to go on and have to go on to somebody. And so obviously going 100 and 365 years out is uh, impractical unless you can figure out a way to collapse it. And there are ways to collapse it. Just remember the merger doctrine. If you can arrange your affairs so that the remainder beneficiary and the annuitant and the trustee are the same person without any contingencies of ownership and fully vested 100%. Under state law, that when all of that occurs sometime after the death of the grantor, your trust collapses and they're entitled to all of the assets. And so you may not have to stay paying annuities for the next 40, 50, 60, 70 years. Okay. Hey, Paul. Uh, hey. It's Phil. I had a question from somebody I wanted to read to you before we move on. Yeah. Uh, someone, um, uh, actually, it was Roberta Robinson asked, if there's a low rate uh, AFR rate balloon note, and that is bequeathed that, uh, to the debtor at the death of the payee, what, can you talk a little bit about the income tax ramifications of that and the consequences? 
Uh, yeah, so um, we think um, the likely answer is from an income tax standpoint. Well, let me first talk about the transfer tax standpoint. Even current existing law says that that low AFR, poorly collateralized, non-marketable note, um, is likely to be entitled to some valuation discount from face value for state tax purposes. That's not necessarily the case for gift tax purposes, but it seems clear to me that the IRS is rolling over on that. From an income tax standpoint, we think that that note will get a step up in basis. And when it gets, gets given back to the person who owes that debt, they can cancel that note and there's no cancellation of indebtedness. However, that has not, that's not fully vetted. There is a theory of cases that say installment notes, which by the way, are IRD, that these types of notes that we're dealing with might be considered income in respect of a decedent, which means they don't get a step up in basis, so that when they are returned to the beneficiary, the IRS might take the position that there is cancellation of indebtedness because you didn't get a step up in basis. I, I think that's the minority view, but I just wanted to mention that. So, yeah, Phil? Oh, no, I was just gonna say, great, thanks. That's the only question we've had so far, thanks. So, we've talked about GRATS. Let's talk about another one of my favorite things that I'm sort of famous for talking about. Let's talk about intentionally defective grantor charitable lead trust. Remember, this is the wealth transfer version, but it is the uh, grantor trust analog of our intentionally defective grantor trust. Grantor makes a contribution, gets an income tax deduction up front, trades that for grantor trust status, but here's what we get to do. We get to lock in a 0.8% 75 20 rate. We get to get all of the assets out of the estate because there's no mortality risk. So those assets will never be included in the estate. And the hope is, is at the end of the day, the beneficiaries get a very large um, zeroed out transfer at the end of the term. A reminder, the 0.8% 75-20 rate because of the three month rule for, for charitable lead trust and charitable remainder trust will be available through July, 2020. And if uh, June goes to 0.6, that will be available through August. Now, remember Rev Prop 2007-45 says, you can backload the payments. Next year's payments can be greater than the previous year's payments. They have just have to be ascertainable. And what that means is if you wanted to do a 20 year class today and you funded it with this $10 million starting amount, you can zero out that gift in any of these ways. You can do a level payment of 543,000 or you can backload the payments like you can do with graphs at a 20% increase or 50%, which is the most popular thing that you see here when you're dealing with CLATS. Or if you want to do it, you can do what was nicknamed in my article, the shark fin clap. By the way, I don't recommend the shark fin clap. And it's not because you can't do it, it's because of an income tax issue. But all of these allow you a $10 million income tax deduction all of them allow you to zero out the gift of the $10 million because you get a charitable gift tax deduction. Why do you backload the payments? Simply because if you backload the payments and you've locked in a 0.8% rate, it means if your assets can compound greater than 0.8% and you don't have to pay it out, you're going to increase one, more wealth out the back end in terms of the remainder values. And most importantly, especially at a time when we're going to have volatile markets over the next few years, and who knows how long that's gonna to continue to go grow, you're not devastating the portfolio by requiring it to make the payments to charity. And remember, think about the Jewish Community Foundation as the beneficiary during this period of time. And so I sort of overlay for you the Great Depression, which took 17 years in order to get there, obviously, if you can backload the payments, 
that will allow you to survive that period of time so that you're not devastating the portfolio as the market continues to go down and you're pulling out a disproportionately large amount. Here are the numbers, some very simple numbers. The, the ending values, if you compound by three, five, or 7%, and what you'll notice, the more you backload, the more value you give in terms of the remainder value. But I will point out to you, the 50% increase at 5, 13, and 25 compete very, very strongly against the shark fin. And so for all of these reasons, one, the shark fin seems a little bit too aggressive. I generally recommend the 50% increase. And so you can see here uh, what this does. The other note I'll make here, if we are worried about mortality, remember these assets are fully out of the estate forever. And so I generally would say that go longer on these things, um, and where you see this very popular is, you know, because um, the remainder interest, generally speaking, cannot is, is subject to GST tax, where you'll see this is where you have um, wealthy clients who are obviously charitably minded to a certain extent, but who have younger children who are going to be the remainder beneficiaries. And so I'll point out to you also, um, there is a very long technical piece uh, in the ACTEC Law Journal from 2016, no, 2015, where I discuss different ways of uh, uh, trying to collapse it if you don't want to, if you go uh, one going long and how to collapse it afterwards, and uh, a lot of the income tax stuff in terms of why I recommend the 50% increase. Okay, last point on the 75-20 rate, private annuities. Now, uh, I think from a practice standpoint, self-canceling installment notes are probably talked about more than private annuities, but I will point out self-canceling installment notes today will have a 1.15% interest rate. Private annuities, you can lock in a 0.8% 75-20 rate. Two, private annuities are statutorily based. So you know exactly how to value these things. And skins, there is no real um, uh, guidance on, on how to deal with skins. And so from an audit standpoint, private annuities are much more acceptable to the IRS than skins are, but we know that the assets, when you sell it to an effective grantor trust, by way of example, the assets in that trust are out of the estate, no matter, uh, are out of the estate, no matter when your client passes away. Third thing I'll point out to you, and lots of people talk about this, is if you are going to do to a defective grant or trust, which you want to do because you get an income tax whipsaw when you do it, um, when you don't do it to a defective grant or trust, because that is a limited fund, you need to meet the exhaustion test, which is nothing more than assuming that the assets that you're selling and that are in the defective grant or trust will grow by the 75-20 rate, which we know is an anemic 0.8%, but that you will have the responsibility of paying the dollar amount to the annuitant under the assumption that they will live to 110 years of age. You're never going to meet it unless you have a cushion of assets already in the defective grantor trust. And here's why, here's why it's particularly important today. We have clients who want to use their bonus exclusion, but they're worried of running out of money they can use the bonus exclusion by making a $5.79 million gift and then going back to this $10 million principal amount and selling an additional 4.21 in a private annuity sale. That taxable gift is the cushion that you need to meet the exhaustion test. And the other thing I'll mention to you about the $4.21 million private annuity sale is that unlike Gratz, unlike Klatz, you can actually do whatever you want in terms of the pattern of annuities. You can do a fixed $217,000 for the rest of their lifetime, guaranteed for the rest of their lifetime. You can um, start at a lower number, 110,000, and have an annual increase of 5% if they're worried about inflation. 
or you can defer the first five or 10 or 15 or 20 because you're worried about mortality and they have enough to live on today. And so what would happen if in year four, your client passes away, nothing is included in the estate, no payments have been made, and all of the assets in the IGIT are out for estate tax purposes. And again, a reminder, these assets just need to grow more than 0.8%. So with that, let's move on to uh, preferred partnerships, qualified or non-qualified. And um, unlike in years past, when I have always pushed for qualified preferred partnerships, I'm going to make this case for non-qualified partnerships, okay? So we all know, uh, and uh, I believe it was seven years ago, eight years ago, I did a presentation at North County on, um, uh, on partnership structures where I discussed this. And so this is a little repetitive, but I think the COVID-19 twist here, I think is critically important. We know what a preferred partnership is. You have a, a group of assets and you split the ownership of those assets into two different types of uh, asset returns. You have a preferred holder and you have a common holder and the preferred, think about it as a uh, bond, right? So by way of example, you put 10 million in, the preferred holder gets $5 million of liquidation preference. Think about that as par value. And they take back an annual payment or the rights to an annual payment every year. But that annual payment is based upon revenue ruling 8513, not the yield today. Today, we just had a client who is um, about to pull the trigger on a preferred. Um, that client on their evaluation report is getting 7% on their preferred. So think about this as a great cash flow when um, interest rates are very low and the ability to freeze the value in their estate for estate tax purposes. The common holder is entitled to any return over and above what is paid out to the preferred holder. And so in my example, if you put 10 million in and half of it is at 7%, that means any return above three and a half percent will go to the common holder and will be out of the estate. So why do you go through all of this and what are the complications? And the real complication here is, how do you value the common interest? And so, one idea that I've been thinking about is, given that our clients all have, at least temporarily, $11.58 million of applicable exclusion, would be kind of interesting if they could play with that in a forward freeze where half of that $5.79 million is returned back to the preferred holder and the other half of it goes to the common holder. And the question or the tax issue that you have here is, how do you value the common interest if, by way of example, what you do with the common interest is you either give it away or more likely you sell it to an intentionally defective grantor trust in return for a $1.15 million, a 1.15% installment note, the subtraction method. Anytime that you have preferred and common structures and you are giving away the common, you have to go under the subtraction method under section 2701. Now I'll make this, uh, I wanna simplify this, but there's a four step process where what you start with is the big number and so the big number here is 11.5, is it 11.58 million dollars? 11.58 million dollars. Let's assume that that's a starting point. It's not really that. It's a, you're allowed to take minority interest discount uh, at the top. Uh, secondly, because you're retaining the senior equity interest as the preferred holder, you're, you can either have a zero value, the zero valuation rule, or 
you can have value, but you can only have value there in terms of what you subtract if the value of the prefer if the if the preferred interest is a qualified payment interest right. Now, a qualified payment interest right to the right hand side is an annual payment that is cumulative. This is extremely important. You need to provide in there that if you're supposed to pay out seven or eight or six percent against five point seven nine million dollars and in one year you don't have the cash flow to make it, you have to make it up in subsequent years. And it has to be at a fixed rate, all of which we've just discussed. As I mentioned, Revenue Ruling 83-120 tells you that the, that the rate you're able to take back is this uh, market interest rate of, of um, you know, six, five, six, seven percent today. Now I will point out, you can't, uh, inflate the value above the liquidation preference, which is $5.79 million. And so, if you do a qualified payment interest right in the way that I'm explaining it, what you start with is, um, I always do the math wrong, $11.58 million at the top. You subtract a $5.79 million at the bot and subtract in step two. That leaves you with $5.79 million that you need to allocate to the preferred interest, right? Which is the common interest that you're either selling or giving. But most importantly, in step number four, you're entitled to take all valuation discounts on that 5.79. Minority interest, lack of marketability, and a discount because all its cash flows and rights are subordinates to the preferred. So I go through this process to just basically say, if you do a qualified payment interest right gift today, you're entitled to more valuation discounts on that common interest or half of, the, of this thing that you're giving away, higher valuation discounts than you would otherwise get with a traditional pro rata partnership. Now, in years past when I've talked about this, I've always said, just do the qualified payment interest right get the benefit of the valuation discount and just make your payments because your clients are likely want to keep the payment. This allows you to freeze the value, keep cash flow for the rest of their lifetime, and you can use your base exclusion to cover what is going to be included in the estate. The problem is, is we've got this bonus exclusion. And we have clients who want, want to have options. And so I explain all of this to say, well, maybe what is smarter is that we should actually trigger intentionally the zero valuation rule. In other words, the math would be um, 11.58 minus zero, which means in step number three, we have an $11.58 million starting taxable gift, even though we're, on, we're only giving away half of this entity that has in total $11.58 million. And so you're thinking, why in God's name would you do that? And the reason for it is this. What I'm talking about here is a non-qualified preferred interest across the bottom. What happens if you give away a common interest when you're holding a non-qualified interest? On the right-hand part of the slide, in green, in that column, it means that the common interest, the starting value of that will be $11.58 million. And typically, under most circumstances, you don't want to have this phantom gift of $11.58 million. You want 5.79, except we all have $11.58 million. And in order to get the benefit of the bonus exclusion, we have to burn up both the base and the bonus. So let's use it up. Let's use our base and our bonus and make a gift today. What does that mean from an estate planning standpoint? What it means from an estate planning standpoint is the following. When your client passes away, they will own a $5.79 million preferred frozen value interest. 
but you don't have any applicable exclusion left. You've used it all up. So isn't that a problem? And the answer is no. And the reason for it is twofold. One, the anti-clawback regulations which were finalized say, we're going to increase your unified credit enough so that if you use your bonus exclusion, we'll give you credit for it. And the second reason for it is, even before that, you had a 25, you had Reg 25.2701-5A3, which said the zero value valuation, which created a phantom gift of 5.79 in the calculation of the estate tax, we're going to give it back to you. So under both sets of circumstances, what ends up happening is, even though you have a $5.79 million asset in the estate, you get a credit back to cover that $5.79 million gift. In other words, you zero out the estate's tax for the preferred holder. Most importantly, remember what this non-qualified payment interest rate is. It is a non-cumulative payment, which is nothing more to say that if you were supposed to receive 6%, against $5.79 million, but it's non-cumulative, it means you have the option to take it or not take it. So your clients every single year can say, I don't need the money, I'm gonna let all of it go over to the common holder, which means you get, the, you get to have the option to keep cash flow when you need it, and you also get the option to pass on 100% of the return to the common holder, and zero out your estate. Okay, um, we've talked about the fact that many of our clients, uh, we need to anticipate uh, unanticipated um, deaths. Um, obviously what that means is um, if we're going to have unexpected and uh, unanticipated deaths, we're, somebody's going to get a step up in basis. And so just a reminder how important it is to understand the tax nature of the types of assets that you have in here. I'll note to you at the top of this chart, which you guys have seen in the past for many years, the assets at the top benefit the most from the step up in basis. The assets at the bottom benefit the least um, from a step up in basis. And I just point out to you that under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, you are going to see an enormous amount for our business clients bonus depreciation qualified property uh, under 168k that the recapture on that bonus depreciation is 1245 recapture which means you have ordinary income tax if you try to sell it and so this is the type of thing that you want to try to force into somebody's estate in order to get rid of the ordinary income tax problem which in california is an almost 50% tax problem with the state income tax rate. Tax basis management uh, basics here. Um, if we anticipating unexpected deaths, you need to be swapping assets um, actively with your defective grantor trust. And most importantly in red, I want you to remember that it's not just high basis property you want to swap with your low basis asset with the idget. You're looking specifically today for property that is at a loss. And the reason for that is if your grantor dies with that asset, you will have a step down in basis and that basis is lost forever. Whereas if you take that same property at that same fair market value and you swap it for a lower basis asset, you will preserve the basis. Because remember, when your client passes away, you have a deemed transfer of the underlying asset to the defective grantor trust, which is now a non-grantor trust. It's like a, it's akin to a gift, uh, it's akin to an income tax gift. And so what that means is the basis is preserved on the gift. You may not be able to take a loss, but if you're able to sell it, either not at a loss or with some gain, you still get that basis. And so just a reminder that you should be looking for a property at a loss today to swap from your grantor's estate 
with your effective grantor trust. And so we're coming up on the nine o'clock hour. Phil, how much time do I have left or am I uh, at the four minute mark? Or have I lost everything? No, I'm, I'm here. <laughs> Sorry, I was looking at the attendee list. Yeah, so we were gonna go till 9.10. 9.10, okay, so I've got some time. Um, let me let me move down uh, a little bit. Um, just so you know, what I'm passing I'm passing over is um, using powers of appointment. Um, I've actually spoken to this group a number of times on this particular idea. Um, I would encourage you to look at the technical materials that are being made available to you and look at the accidentally perfect grand tour trust. Um, it allows you to push assets up the generation line use other people's applicable exclusion by giving them a testamentary power of appointment, but it also gives you the option, as long as they don't exercise the power of appointment, to take the position that an ongoing trust for the benefit of the younger generations, back down the generation line, can continue to be a grantor trust as to the original grantor. It is 100% a truism that you can take this position on there. Um, in the last 10 minutes, let me um, um, go on to uh, a couple of things that I think um, will become important, especially under this, uh, under this idea of we're going to have unexpected, unanticipated deaths, and we're going to want to maximize this step up in basis. And so eliminating valuation discounts. Maybe this is a common situation that you have with your clients. You've got an FLP. You've done transfers. You've got a very low asset, but every one of the partners, let's call it 10 of the family members here has, you know, uh, $10 million or more um, of applicable exclusion. And you have an asset that's only worth 10, 20 or $30 million. And so what that means is as each of these partner pass, partners pass away, they're likely not going to have an estate's tax problem but they won't get a full step up in basis to full fair market value or liquidation value because they own a minority interest in a lack of marketability family limited partnership. And the IRS is going to get smart and start working the valuation discount against you. So how do you get rid of valuation discounts? And let me explain to you that some, most people will say, well, why don't we just, you could liquidate the entity. The problem is, if you liquidate the entity, you might be undoing many of the many of the things that you've done before. Two, you may jeopardize some transaction that you've had in the past. Three, um, liquidating the entity uh, can have uh, uh, severe sort of practical consequences where you have uh, you know ten people owning a piece of property. Second point I'll make here: while a state uh, planning presenters will talk about just getting rid of the restrictions in the limited partnership agreement. I don't think that works. Uh, for state law reasons, I don't think that works. And for 2704 purposes, I don't think it works. But there is, thankfully, uh, a much easier way, I think, of just getting rid of valuation discounts. And it is simply converted to a general partnership. Now, why does that work? It works because unlike the LLC, and the LP statutes, which around the United States were amended to get rid of each owner's rights to get fair value or liquidation value on death or transfer or liquidation. Um, the GP statutes for the most part have not changed. The GP statutes say each owner is entitled to fair value, which has been interpreted to be liquidation value when they pass away. And so by simply converting the limited partnership to a GP, we'll get rid of all of the valuation discounts. Now, remember, there's a reason why nobody does a GP anymore, and it is because of limited liability. And if you want to have limited liability and get rid of the valuation discounts, do a two-step process here. And that two-step process is first, each partner puts into his or her own wholly owned holding LLC their limited partnership interests. And then after they've done that, you then convert the underlying FLP to a GP. What that does is 
It allows you to get rid of all of the valuation discounts and have all of the limited liability that you need to have during lifetime. Okay, last um, idea. Um, and this sort of falls under the guise of, again, um, this is a common thing that you'll see in lots of large estates. Uh, and two, you, uh, if you're not thinking about this and how to get rid of this, you need to put in a mechanism in order to avoid this problem, especially if you suddenly get a phone call that your client is on the way to ICU. Okay, common situation. Years ago, your client did an installment sale to an intentionally defective grantor trust. Let's just say that asset today is worth $100 or $100 million. And the way that uh, it got in there is that the grantor sold it for $50 million 10 years ago. And what you've been doing is you've been paying interest only with a balloon note at some point um, and the defective grantor trust owes $50 million to the grantor, but because you needed this to be a bona fide installment sale, you had to collateralize the asset. So the defective grantor trust owns a $100 million asset, has no basis, but it collateralizes a $50 million debt. Now, let me make this clear. The issue that you have here will occur when your client passes away. And what will happen when your client passes away is that if the IRS is smart, they will take the position that you trigger $50 million of gain. Now, I am not saying that on all intentionally defective grantor trust sales, when your grantor passes away with a note outstanding, that you suddenly have a taxable event. I understand that there is, nobody really knows what happens at that point. And I understand that most people believe you don't have a taxable event and death cannot be a recognition event. And I will acknowledge, and the IRS has basically rolled over, it's likely not to be a winning argument for the IRS. However, what argument will be a winning argument for the IRS is the following. Is the one thing that they have said about what happens when a grantor dies or when you turn off grantor trust status is you have a deemed transfer of the underlying asset at that time. And note here, this situation that I'm pointing out to you is a situation where you have a deemed transfer of an asset that has debt in excess of basis. And Crane versus Commissioner, Supreme Court case said many years ago, any transfer that is subject to a debt, and if the debt is in excess of basis, you trigger the gain, which means it is straightforward uh, tax 101, you will trigger $50 million of gain. Think about all of the installment sales that you uh, all have done for all of your real estate clients uh, who have depreciated their assets down to nothing and still have a debt outstanding on it. Now, you could um, pay off the debt, right? So maybe take assets in kind and distribute them back to the grantor equal to the $50 million debt. The problem here is that's not so easy to do um, with real estate or illiquid assets. Two, you will be subject to valuation discount ideas. And so you're gonna be, um, you're gonna lose on the valuation discount side of it by giving it in kind. And three, it just may not be practical for you to, oh, three, this may be your highest appreciating asset, which means, the longer you keep this in place, the better off you are from a transfer tax standpoint. And so you want to keep this in place rather than paying it back. And third, you just may not have time to write all the deeds and do all the things in order to pay that debt off again. So how do I avoid this problem? How do I make it go away? And how do I possibly get a partial step up in basis on an asset that otherwise would not get a step up in basis without a $50 million taxable gain. And here's how you do it. 
you have the defective grantor trust and the grantor contribute everything that they own to a limited liability company. Now, note here, this is an LLC with two owners, except 8513 tells us that the defective grantor trust and grantor are treated for all income tax purposes as one taxpayer, which means the IRS has already said, if you have one taxpayer, even if it is a grantor or a defective grantor trust, um, they are treated as one taxpayer, so you have a disregarded entity, which is a long way of saying the grantor, the grantor trust, and the LLC are one taxpayer, which means when the defective grantor trust put in the assets subject to the debt, you did not trigger any gain because you're the same taxpayer. Now, the disregarded entity owes the, the $50 million, has acquired the rights to get paid back the $50 million and the asset all together in one. State law says, if you own the asset and you own the debt and you own the rights to receive the debt back from yourself, that debt simply disappears. You don't own it anymore. There is no debt anymore. And so just by doing this, your debt, your note has disappeared, which means you obviously you can't have any gain because there can't be any cancellation of a debt in this because the defective grantor trust, the grantor and the LLC are all the same taxpayer. And so just by doing this, you've made it disappear. What happens when your grantor passes away? Well, your LLC will now have two taxpayers, the non-grantor trust in the estate, and it will convert to a partnership, which means the estate owns something and it will get a step up in basis. Now I point out to you revenue ruling 99-5. 99-5 says on a conversion of a disregarded entity to a partnership, you are not deemed to die or transfer a partnership interest. You're deemed to acquire half of the assets and then create a newly created partnership the second after death, which is another way of saying the estate of the grantor is deemed to own half of this asset which will get a full step up in basis with no valuation discount and then contribute that to a newly created partnership. So you get a full step up in basis on the estate's half in an asset that otherwise would not have gotten a step up in basis with the intentionally defective grantor trust and you have no gain. The last thing I'll point out to you is the reason why this is particularly helpful today is this is something that smart advisors put in place today. In other words, they create the limited liability company today. They have the, the grantor create the limited liability company today and fund it with a dollar. And then they just keep it in place. And they have signed transfer documents of the defective grantor trust assets and the promissory notes and the debt itself ready to go so that if you have an emergency and your client is going to ICU, you can immediately pull the trigger on this, make the debt disappear and have this put in place. And by the way, you can undo it also if hopefully your client recovers from this malady. With that, uh, we've run out of time. Uh, I just want to say there are some additional things having to do with basis stripping and shifting. I've discussed those things with you all in the past. Again, there's a very long technical outline that's uh, just been updated that I think you'll find helpful. It discusses many of the things in here. Um, and um, I just want to say that uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you all in person again, um, whether it's in the new normal or we go back to normal, which would be uh, absolutely wonderful. And I just want to say to all of my friends in the, in the Orange County and San Diego area, um, you know, um, be well, be happy, be safe. Hey, uh, Paul, excellent presentation. I can hear the applause in my head. Yeah, <laughs> I, think, I think there's was uh, 86 participants plus the people here. A um, uh, couple things. Uh, one other, you know, I always tell clients you kind of navigating through 
uh, income taxes and estate taxes and uh, and you did a good presentation. One other thing in California, which is always peculiar for us is uh, real property taxes and Prop yeah. 13. So that when it's real property inside partnerships and the parent-child exclusion is another, yet another uh, hurdle we all have to deal with out here. And sometimes I have to figure out what's the most important uh, tax. Is it the death tax, the property tax, or the step up in basis? So that's one other I'll thing for us you, Californians. I'll mention to you um, one of the things that I, I skipped over um, on some of the previous slides is uh, one idea that I think is really interesting, uh, specifically um, you know, with Prop 13 property, is um, it. it if, if you want to get, if you want to save on estates taxes, but you want to get a full step up in basis on the underlying asset, and you don't want to necessarily trigger a Prop 13 reevaluation of the property for property tax purposes, you may want to consider doing a private derivative contract. So, you know, take a, take a, a tool out of the estate planning toolbox um, at, that's used in other places where um, people try to, to um, transfer their carry derivative interest, their profits interest. And what you do is you negotiate with an effective grant or trust and you sell it for a promissory note, the appreciation on the underlying asset. And so what, what your, what your, where your client is, is your client still owns 100% of the asset, but your client has an obligation to pay to the trust at some point in the future the appreciation on that asset over the term of the contract. And so what that allows you to do is not have to make a contemporaneous transfer today. If your client passes away, you get a full step up in basis and you may never have to transfer it and stepped up assets can be returned to the defective grantor trust to satisfy the obligation of the transferor. And so that's one option that I particularly like. That's good. So, and then going back to your earlier comments where you mentioned how the, they potentially could increase the estate tax, get tax rates or reduce the credit. Yeah. What, what's your, I mean, what's more likely do you think increased rates or reductions in credits? Uh, I think increased rates. You know, I, I, I think, you know, I just get the sense that the, the political winds are such that, you know, if, if let's just say they make it permanent, they make the doubling permanent, but they maybe stop the increase in inflation or maybe even keep the increase in inflation, right? What that means is, you know, basically everybody uh, of, a, of, you know, $11 million of exclusion, $11 million of um, uh, net worth not set, won't have an estate tax problem, but everybody over and above that will have a 55 or 60 or 70% estate tax problem. I think that's, much more palatable politically um, than obviously a wealth tax or taking away an exclusion uh, from people. Interesting. So I, I don't have any other questions that are coming through. I don't know. Um, if, uh, Phil, I, Phil and Paul, I just wanted to direct you to the chat. If you click on the chat button, there were some questions about um, your GRAT um, example. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if you want to address Let's those. See. So uh, there's a question here. Um, oh yeah. You no offense, rat only makes sense if someone is completely uninsurable. It is far more beneficial otherwise and efficient to transfer assets into a SLAT, um, modified irrevocable life insurance trust and purchase an estate tax free, uh, free, tax free and multi-generational asset that is free uh, from creditors, divorce and estate inclusion I'd be interested in running the numbers side by side. Um, RJ Kelly, my guess is you work in the insurance in industry. So I agree with some of the stuff that you're saying, um, but I don't think it. You know, I don't. I don't think it is just simply the uninsurable. Rem remember what this grad idea does. This grad idea allows you to have the functionality of keeping cash flow for a certain period of time, which is which is not guaranteed with a slat. So, you know, with the SLAT, you know, your spouse could divorce you and you don't have that access to it. Third, you may not, you, you can't be guaranteed that the testamentary power of appointment is going to be exercised in favor back to the original grantor. 
Um, three, again, if you don't do it in the right state, the, the exercise of the power of appointment um, uh, will actually cause those assets to be subject to uh, creditors of the estate. What the GRAT gives you is cash flow, guaranteed inclusion, which is likely to be uh, an inclusion um, that is much less in value than the asset that you've retained the right on the income from for the rest of your lifetime. And you also have the ability to go ahead and collapse it after the fact. Um, what about section, hold on, there's a question here on, uh, what about section 102 as a means for the beneficiary to avoid uh, cancellation debt in this income upon receiving a bequest of a promissory note? Again, I don't, I don't, I don't know if that actually works. Um, it's, it's likely to be uh, the possibility, you can only say that I think if you can say that what the, what the owner of the debt uh, has is basis in the promissory note, and that when it gets returned to them, it gets canceled, that it, it gets returned back. And so I think most people take the position that uh, it's not a taxable event um, and it's not IRD, but I, I think there's a risk. Um, that asset purchased in part is the life insurance contract, but also a diversified portfolio with a four and a half percent income stream versus tax-free muni rates. So again, um, depends on the mathematics of the life insurance contract. Uh, if it's a very, listen, there's lots of insurance folks here who uh, uh, will know lots more about insurance contracts. But again, that all depends on the underlying life insurance contract and the investment options that you have in there. Um, that may be all the questions. Yeah. And then... The, the millet can be for a single person that is different than a slap. Well, um, but you can't, retain, you can't retain the rights to it if you want it out of the estate, RJ. I think, I think that's all the questions. Yeah, I think you're correct. Well, again, Paul, uh, fantastic job. And there's already uh, people saying, uh, echoing what I just said. And uh, thanks for your time and thanks for your presentation. I, Ali, there was a question about the, the materials. Uh, I think we sent a link, but if uh, people didn't get the materials, you can uh, contact Ali or contact me, and uh, I have a copy of the PowerPoint, and I could send it to you, and I'm sure uh, Paul can as well. A um, couple just uh, final notes. Uh, we didn't do our um, Hot Topics presentation today. I think we're getting into a new... Um, normal, I guess, on how we're going to do these meetings. So I think we'll work that out and Bill will have more information for the next meeting. And then the, again, the next meeting is on June uh, 2nd and it will be a webinar. It is uh, Steve Chittister of Withers Bergman and John Kramer of WealthPoint on a charitable planning topic that uh, we'll send more information out uh, on that as well. And I think that's all the notes I have. Uh, Ollie or Jeremy, did you guys have anything else? I just wanted to say that this was recorded and we will um, be putting it online. Uh, it'll be on the JCF website and we'll send out a link so that um, you guys um, can all have access to it because there was a lot of material to digest today. Um, but um, so that will be available as soon as we can get it up online. Yeah, it's terrific. Okay, and uh, yeah, just to echo again what Paul said, everybody, be safe, and uh, it's a, certainly an interesting historic time in, in my life, that's for sure. And uh, I'm wishing everybody the best, and everybody have a good day and a good week. And again, Paul, thank you very much for all your hard work. My pleasure. It's wonderful to, quote, unquote, see everybody. It's good to be right. Take care. Take care. We're, we're adjourned.